So welcome everyone to today's Ascolite Open Educational Practices Special Interest Group webinar. I'm super excited today to hear from Adrian Stagg, uh, which will be a wonderful talk. Uh, for those of you who haven't been to one of these meetings before, we hold um, regular webinars on topics related to open educational practices in Australia. Um, and also monthly meetings to connect with each other, share our practices. Another thing we do to share is we put out a monthly digest on all things open education in Australasia. And we have a whole team dedicated to that who do a fantastic job of that. It's, it's on our website um, and you can subscribe to yeah, our website to receive those digests every month. Uh, so today is an example of our research and practice based uh, webinars. I also wanted to um, do a acknowledgement of country and acknowledge that this event's taking place wherever we are on the lands of the traditional custodians of Australia, the Indigenous people, First Nations, um, and that that land, until a treaty is signed, is unceded land. So yeah, really exciting today to have Adrian speaking to us. Uh, he's played a huge part in the uh, development and um, facilitation of open educational practices in Australia. And as I mentioned before, is a co-convener of this group. Um, he's worked in public libraries, academic libraries. He's been an e-learning designer, learning technologist. He's got all kinds of qualifications, masters of library and information management, and quite recently submitted his PhD thesis through the University of Tasmania on, on this very topic um, in November. So everyone, if everyone can give a round of applause um, to Adrian, that'd be fantastic because I know he's put a lot of work into that. And yeah, his research areas focus on the ecology of open educational practices in Australian higher education and uh, policy related to those initiatives. He's a member of so many open education groups from OERU to Open Education Network and also facilitates the fantastic uh, UniVSQ Open Education Staff Scholarship Scheme. And you can also find him on Twitter at Open Kuroko. I'm not sure what Kuroko means, but maybe Adrian, Adrian can tell us. Um, so uh, let's get started. I'm going to stop sharing and Adrian, feel free to share your slides now. Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you, Stephen, for both the opportunity and for that um, remarkably kind introduction. Uh, I will hopefully over the next hour try to live up to some of that um, as we go through the, uh, the presentation. Now, before, um, before I go any further, I also want to acknowledge the um, traditional landowners upon uh, whose land I work, live, and enjoy life. And also, uh, importantly, uh, from my perspective, is to acknowledge the fact that um, the uh, our First Nations Australians were the first uh, people involved in learning and teaching in this country. Uh, the first uh, learners, the first teachers, the first researchers. And so it's in that spirit that I would like to continue today. As Stephen mentioned, this is uh, a, a very small snapshot, a very small corner of uh, my thesis, which was submitted. And thank you everyone for the, uh, for, for, for the congratulations as well. I'm still waiting on my examiner's report. Um, so we'll We'll see, we'll see what happens from there. Uh, but uh, this is really about context, about landscape and about environment. And Stephen mentioned beforehand that I'm available on Twitter via Open Kuroko. And what is a Kuroko? Well, it's a good, it's a good question, Stephen, and your check is in the mail. Uh, because a Kuroko is, um, a, it comes from Japanese no theater. And you have all of the actors 
who often wear masks, they wear very colourful costumes, and then you have the background, which is all black or all white. Now, the Kuroko are not actors. What they do is they work behind, and so if you've got a black background, they are dressed in head to toe in black so the audience doesn't notice that they are there, and they are responsible for changing the set. They change the landscape and they do all of the little jobs during the performance so the actors can concentrate on acting. They do what is best. And I kind of see um, that part of the role of open practice, especially in a support role like mine, is that I work in the background and I help to alter the landscape. I make things easier so that academics can concentrate on the intellectual work that they need to do. And that, you know, uh, myself and my team uh, can actually be in the background, kind of blending in, moving things in the background. And so that's why environment's very important to me as well um, in the context of this research. So when, when we consider, um, let me just move my way forward. In terms of an introduction, Stephen um, gave a very generous introduction at the beginning, so I certainly won't cover all of those again. However, the one thing that I would like to really um, dwell on at this point is a word about my supervisors, and that's Dr. Karina Basu, who is at the uh, Open University in the United Kingdom, and Professor Natalie Brown at the University of Tasmania. Now, we've all heard the phrase that if I have seen far, it is because I have stood on the shoulders of giants. And I'm extremely fortunate to have seen even further because I have had two giants to help me. And I have been to PhD workshops and the like where people have, have discussed relationships with supervisors. And I can honestly say you are not going to find two better people, two better humans than, uh, than Karina and Natalie, who have been incredibly supportive uh, throughout the entirety of the time that I have been on this journey. So I really didn't want to go any further without acknowledging the, the, the huge contribution that they have made to my thinking and my practice. So first of all, I did mention in the very beginning that we were going to ask people about why, what kinds of research they would actually do if they had the time or the resources or the like to be able to do it. I'm also going to ask you a question now, and I'd like to see some answers in the chat as, uh, um, as we go through, about why we should conduct research especially research into open educational practice. So I'm just going to turn off my mic for, for, for a short bit and just let people think and pop some stuff in the chat and we'll see what we get. So why should you conduct research, especially into open educational practice? I'm seeing already some really good thoughts coming through in the chat about this being a new field. So having evidence, um, also uh, being able to legitimize open educational practice, have evidence of impact. Um, also, um, I saw a comment there about us being able to challenge assumptions about exploring. And also, well, um, James as well mentions here as about um, finding out why OEP is such a hard sell. Um, Cartier's got evidence for lobbying for funding and all of these uh, advocacy and the like, these are all elements. And I'm glad to see that this is kind of lining up with what I have on my very next slide. But please feel free, if you do have any other thoughts, um, please continue to put them in the chat and we'll revisit those. So, in terms of being able to uh, structure today's presentation, I thought about the reasons as to why I engaged in this research. And it was around 
things like recognizing open as a discrete discipline, exploring a level of self-awareness, who am I as a researcher, exploring openness in a rigorous manner, making a contribution to the overall discussion, providing evidence for advocacy, and really it, it allows you to return from research as a changed person. I often say that, especially in libraries, it's really important that we engage in education because not uh, in research, sorry, uh, because what happens is it helps us to think about the world or see the world very differently than the way we did at the very beginning. And the other reason to do it is it gives us an area to hang our hat on. It gives us a discipline to essentially say, this is me. And so being able to say to, to other researchers that my research area is open education, educational policy. These are labels, these are words that I can use that help to describe who I am, especially when I'm having a conversation with an academic staff member or having a, um, a discussion with research staff. It very much helps. And so I would encourage everyone to consider how that fills, um, perhaps fills a gap or perhaps how it contributes to their own practice. Now, also when we consider that open as a discrete discipline, this is something which I've said an awful lot to our uh, grant uh, program folks here at USQ, is that they will come into an open grant and they will be discipline experts in their own area. And so what we're doing is we're getting them to recognize that open is its own discipline area as well. And it's possible to integrate the two. Um, then of course, you can bring other things in like the scholarship of learning and teaching and the like, and start to overlap and start to integrate this to get something that is far richer than the original version. And to me as well, being engaged in this area is not, it's not good enough to just explain why things are. It's actually about how do we create a flourishing ecology of practice? How do we actually nurture this so that it becomes mainstream, so that it becomes an attractive and viable practice in higher education? And people are far more aware of it than what they currently are. So really, when I started this off, I started to look at the uh, focus on the literature, what exactly does most of the open research literature talk about? And there's, there's a ton of material on things like perceptions, what people do, what their attitudes are to open, whether or not policy is, is up to scratch in the area, the con contribution to learning and teaching. There's a lot around student savings, um, student success and the like, but to a much lesser degree, there is, a, there is not much discussion on exactly how it is supported at that granular level. And almost completely absent are studies that examine the interaction between practitioners and their environment and how that actually influences and mediates how open educational practice manifests at the local level. And that's what I was interested in. Why do people do things? And if you really wanted kind of, you know, the very simplistic um, heading um, for everything that I do, it's really, why do people do what they do? Uh, so it's, it's pretty simple, really. But as with all things, things that appear simple are often the most complex. I think that because I've used the word ecology a number of times already, I should probably define it so that we're all on the same page. So ecology is very broadly speaking, the relationship between an organism and its environment. Often we'll use it for the natural world. So we'll talk about, um, we'll talk about animals and we'll talk about the environment that they're in and how the environment contributes to how the animal behaves. Um, and also how the animal's behavior often has impact on the environment. We can do the same with human beings. And so, if we examine this from the perspective as practitioners develop as developing humans, so they're developing their practices, whether they are open, whether it's learning and teaching, whether or not it's disciplinary, we are all developing, we are all learning. And we have the institution then as the environment. And so if we put if we frame both of these things in that way, it could yield an ecology of practice that maps interactions 
and also helps us to identify the factors that either limit or enhance flourishing practice. And I will say it again and again through this presentation, context is everything, which is why I don't generalize. Uh, this is why I approach things from a case study perspective, but I'll cover that in just one moment. So really um, what I would like to do is just so that you understand how important context is, Part of this is also the context of me as a researcher and my place within the research. And I do this through paradigm and also through a process called reflexivity. Now, where, as I mentioned before, you know, somewhere to hang your hat, some words that help describe who you are and what you do. This was the most mind blowing thing that I read at the beginning of my research is paradigm because suddenly all the things that were in my head that I couldn't articulate, I had words for. And that's just, it's an incredibly empowering experience. So I find out through the reading that I most like and most align with the pragmatist paradigm. And really what it does is it rejects the notion that there is a single objective truth. Instead, what it says is that there are multiple truths and these truths are interpreted through the lens of individuals. There are multiple realities, there are multiple ways of knowing, and when it comes to actually producing research and engaging with research methods, they tend not to be traditionalists in that they will automatically cleave to a particular notion. Instead, what it is, is, is assembling the tools that are required to get the best results. And this is the reason why I am a mixed methods researcher as well. I see ways of layering mixed methods approaches so that you are enhancing the strengths and mitigating the weaknesses. Now, one of the critiques for the pragmatist is that often it gets seen as um, somebody who, you know, this is where you are if you don't know what you're doing and it's just a grab bag of things, you're a magpie. No, one of the really important things of both this and mixed methods research is that everything needs to have a deliberate, purposeful and logical reason for existing within the confines of your research project and that you can justify the inclusion of each aspect. And that's what, that's what I have done through here. Now, also, prag pragmatist paradigms tend to have shared values about community, democracy, freedom, and equality. These are things which I feel very strongly about, and these are things which I think are a perfect fit for open education as well. The last part of it is that this is not what we would tend to call pure or theoretical research. The idea is conducting research so that it can be translated into practice. So it can actually inform practice and can be used. So there's a very strong practical element to what we do. Um, so then if I'm saying that I recognize multiple truths and realities, I have to acknowledge my own. And this is a process called reflexivity. And um, really what it does is it allows some self-reflection where you actually um, articulate your own assumptions, your positioning, your behavior, where you are situated in terms of the research. And given the fact that I'm embedded in a range of activities uh, concerning open both at the institutional level and with some other organizations, there is a certain amount of, let's call it assumptions or baggage or, or that positionality that I bring to open research. Um, and again, this is the idea that there isn't a single objective truth. And indeed, when I consider my own position, I can't be objective either. It's simply not possible, uh, or at least this is the way that I, I perceive things. However, you can use reflexivity to articulate the things that do allow for subjective interpretation of the data that you're dealing with. So we've got our three selves, and I've got some information about that on the slide here, that this is a way of really just interpreting who you are and what position you have or what situates you within the research. The other thing that, that um, I was very fond of through this is what is called a methodology of friendship, which is where 
I openly state as part of this that I am actually conducting this research to advance a particular phenomenon. What I'm doing is I'm essentially saying that I am acting in friendship or in community with the people who are the research participants. I have a specific agenda, that agenda being that I want to advocate for, I want to advance something that the research participants are all interested in. And so this, this is the core of the methodology of friendship. So those are the things there, the, the pragmatist, the reflexivity, the methodology of friendship. These are the contexts then that I use to approach the research. Now, I also mentioned exploring the landscape in a fairly rigorous manner. And the way that I did this um, for this piece of research was uh, through a mixed methods approach. Remember when I said beforehand about mixing things together so that they make a certain amount of sense, being able to justify? Well, phase one was a survey that went out over 46 respondents across Australia um, within three case study sites for, for those. I then did some analysis and I said, what's going on? What can I find out of here? And what do I need to know more information about? That then inf informed some semi-structured interviews. And I did interviews with 15 staff um, from across uh, the three uh, institutions and then did some analysis on that. Then you take the analysis that was done on the survey, the analysis uh, that was done for the um, interviews. And because this was case study, I put this also against things like institutional evidence, things like policy, procedure. Do they have a support website? Do they have support um, materials that are easily ac um, accessible? And there's a, a whole range of materials that I was able to openly access as a member of the general public that would then feed into constructing a narrative for each one of these cases. I used a, 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 an approach called bounded case studies, which is essentially where you define what a case study is and what it isn't. In this type, the case was the institution. And the idea here is that you're telling a story about a single institution and their interaction with a particular phenomenon. So I am very disinterested in taking all three and doing a comparison because that is not the point of bounded case studies. You're telling three distinct stories and then you're basic, basically putting forward your analysis and your discussion on each one separately. Yes, there will be commonalities. Yes, there will be points of difference, but those are for the reader. The reader will pick those up anyway in the manner in which they are presented. So sitting over all of this then, and this is the last thing to bear in mind, is that we have this idea of constructed realities. I said beforehand, right at the very beginning, this is about how we interpret individual truths, individual ways of experiencing open practice. And so I use the work of, of uh, Bronfen Brenner, in particular, the um, theory of human development and his ecology of human development. And the, the reason why is that Bronfen Brenner started, uh, he's developed, he was a developmental psychologist, worked with children a lot, and then worked with um, K to 12. But essentially he argued that coming up with generalizable traits for human beings and generalizable experiences is actually a waste of time because it doesn't capture the unique complexity of an individual. He also argues that you can take a whole range of people who have extremely similar backgrounds, they will not turn out the same way. The way in which they react to stimulus will not be the same. The way they internalize new ideas will not be the same. And so each person has a life world, which is essentially their reality that they carry around with them. And that reality is constantly being updated based on how they interact with the world and other people's realities. And so in his case, reality is more dynamic than static and is individualized. And so rather than seeking truth in you know, clinical laboratory settings, his, he advocated for actually looking for truth, looking for the way in which people interpret the world, where they interpret it. So in situ, in this case, in the university. 
So one of the things that I want you to remember as we go through here and I, I show you the framework is that the whole purpose of a model or a framework is it's an attempt to represent reality to varying degrees of success and varying degrees of complexity. And I want you to think about if, if you've seen things like you know, people making model planes or if you've ever been to a model train exhibition. Both of these activities are trying to replicate something that already exists in reality. You're trying to replicate you know, a plane in very small dimensions, and that may have a certain amount of um, detail and it may have um, a, a great degree of, well, verisimilitude against the original aircraft. The same if you go to a model train exhibition, you'll see people taking great amount of pains to build terrain around it and tunnels and get the grass right and all of those sorts of things. They are attempting to represent reality as truthfully as possible through their own lens. And that is what we do with research when we are working with models and frameworks. We're trying to represent reality. But again, it's through our own lens. So there's four levels of Bronfen from Brenner's ecology. And it starts off with a microsystem, which is about you. It's about you as an individual human being. And what, what it says is that you are the result of all the interactions, of all the experiences that you have had to date. How you construct your identity is really to do with the microsystem. And this is who you are. It is essentially who you are when you are by yourself, your truest, your truest person. Meso systems occur when you have these microsystems interacting. Now that can be you interacting with a colleague. And when those two bump up against each other, we have an interaction of, of life worlds, of systems. And sometimes what will happen is you'll find that there's a great degree of alignment. Sometimes there's a level of dissonance. Sometimes what happens is you will leave, go your separate ways. But through that interaction, your microsystem has actually changed because maybe you've come in contact with a different experience, a different idea, a different perspective, and you've now assimilated that into your idea. Meso systems can also occur if you meet somebody in a different context. So let's say, for example, the me at work is a different person in general terms to me at home. And so if somebody from work was coming into my home, I would have a certain amount of mental negotiation to do internally where I was saying, but that person is used to seeing me at work. They're now going to see me at home. Am I okay with that? The other thing can happen when you bump into people in different contexts. I used to work in a public library and I worked in young people's services. So a large portion of my time was spent doing things like school visits, story time, holiday activities. And one of the things that my wife had to adjust to when uh, when she first met me and we, we would go out and do the grocery shopping is that there would be small children um, at Coles who would be waving at me and would call out my name because they recognized me from the library. And so, of course, you then had my wife who was saying, hang on, how, how do all these small children know you? And, and negotiating then work me and the me that she knew. But then you also had parents who were having to negotiate with the, ah, okay, Adrian from the library. And now, you know, he's out here in a social setting. But also then you would watch um, what, what went on in the children's heads because it was suddenly Adrian, who is at the library, who tells me stories, is out getting bread and milk. And they would have to reconcile those systems as well. So you can see how, how those systems uh, interplay. You then get exosystems. These are the sorts of things that have an impact on you, but generally speaking, you can't change. So in an institution, they tend to be things like policy, uh, the conditions of your contract, those sorts of things. Macro systems are at the highest societal level. These are things which are baked in at the cultural level and will often take generations to change. Um, and so with these four systems, it's possible then to look at a person's interaction with a particular phenomenon and to then be able to 
rate or at least dovetail these in with various levels of the ecology and talk about the influences and why things happen. So the last thing is putting it all together. So I started off by saying that there was a perceived lack of understanding of practitioners in their environment. I then understand myself as a researcher. I understand the position of myself uh, through paradigm and through reflexivity. And then I've constructed using overlapping methods, a bounded case study narrative so that I can hopefully work towards explaining what is going on. And one of the most important things that I have done is make sure that the, that the information speaks for itself. Now, I love this quote. Um, it was um, Hausman was commenting uh, or critiquing on the works of his colleagues, saying that often that they used um, statistics as a drunken man uses a lamppost for support rather than illumination. And I'm hoping that as I go through here, you can see that I've used the information for illumination rather than immediate support, trying to find out what is going on. So I'm going to take a short pause here before we go into the actual findings and then recommendations and just see if anyone does have any questions before I go forward. Okay, if something comes to mind, please feel free. Oh, we've got something in the chat. Okay, keen to hear about the results. Excellent, excellent. Your check is in the mail as well, James, because that's exactly what we're doing right now. Okay, so what did I find out there? Now, I've taken a snapshot of a few of the systems, trying to distill the entire research um, in one go into one hour, not going to happen. So let's take a look at some of the, the findings. If I may, yeah. Adrian, there yes, actually please. is a second question in the ah, chat from Rani. Mm -hmm. um, Rani's asked, are these images AI generated? If so, which site? No, they are not. And in fact, you will find that at the very end of this presentation, my practice, um, there's two practices you can do with Creative Commons or public domain images. One is that you can provide the attribution on the slide. I put it actually in the, the notes for each slide. The second way is that you can have a slide at the end of your presentation, which has got all of the images in order of appearance. And you will find that I have opted for that way. There is a full list of attributions at the end of this. I got all of my images from Pixabay and I deliberately steered clear of any image that had the tag AI generated. This is actually digital art from actual human beings. Um, so I hope that answers your question and there will be the slide at the end where you'll be able to, if you like any of these images, you can follow the links and then reuse them to your heart's content. Thanks for that, Adrian. Cool. Okay, so remembering what I said about models and reality, we have uh, we have the four layers of our ecology, and for a lot of places, the ecologies were very similar. At the microsystem, we found practitioner values were very important. Uh, open fluency, so a person's ability to use open resources. At the MISO system, learning and teaching practices came out at the front. Um, at exosystems, the autonomy that a person has in the selection of their resources and materials, uh, what support and what policy exists at that level. And at the macro system, we had some questions about national priorities. So first of all is practitioner ideology. Overwhelmingly, at each one of the sites, and for different reasons, uh, we, we found that practitioner ideology played a massive part in why people were motivated, and it was actually what motivated them. Now, to differentiate some terminology here, philosophy is the way that we explain why things are. Ideology is how we explain how things should be. And a lot of people, when interviewed, they were able to articulate how they thought things should be. And so we have our respondents who talk about whether it's altruistic motivation, whether or not it's part of their core values. They want to help people. They want to make knowledge accessible to other people. They want to improve people's lives. And that they think that open education can be a vehicle 
to make change for people to better themselves. Also, we see from other academics here, I see higher education as an immense privilege and I want that to be distributed. Philosophical disposition that says we want to be fair, we want to be honest, we want to be generous, we want to give rather than take. And also with another academic, um, we actually think that we've already collected the paycheck, so to speak, from the taxpayer wants. And this is this respondent's rationale for then providing information for free to the general public. The idea that universities are paid for by taxpayers and therefore there is an ethical responsibility to share that information for free. What this, what this does is that it shows that almost every single person who was interviewed was motivated in some way by a value connected to open education. They got very excited about open ed because it allowed them to enact their values through their practice. Now, the question does come up, of course, what happens when things within the university stop you from being able to enact your ideology or where there is values conflict? We then have what's called constructive deviance. Now, constructive deviance, one of my favorite phrases now, uh, is what happens when somebody acts in a way that is uh, motivated positively by their ideology, but it conflicts with the general environment of the institution. So there might be policy which says, you're not allowed to uh, um, license material openly, or perhaps there isn't a policy which says you can, so it is inferred that you can't. Well, what constructive deviance occurs when the person goes ahead with it anyway, and their activity can be seen as generating value for the institution. And this came about through workflow and about policy for the most point. Um, so we had one of the respondents say, the actual policy says there's a workflow, but I just put a Creative Commons license on my work and I work outside the, the policy. I recognize it isn't very helpful, but it gets stuff done. Another person who says that, that when they have been asked, who owns the rights to, to the work that you've produced? I simply say that I produced it outside of work hours and so it's mine. Um, and so you have people and then paradoxically, they say it largely works on a trust system. Um, make of that what you will. But we then see that ideology is so important to open practitioners that they are willing to go against policy and against institutional culture when they see a conflict. So essentially ideology trumps policy and trumps local institutional culture. So I've got some recommendations around that. Right now, we're just kind of looking at the findings. With learning and teaching resources, the next one. Now, this was um, about attitudes to learning and teaching resources broken up into a range of um, into a range of types of resources. Now, what's important here is taking a look at the blue sections. The blue is their likelihood to adopt a resource. So the first one on your left there is the likelihood to adopt commercial learning resources by category. And you see what happens here is that a lot of them, it's middle of the road. Some of them are quite low. Things like videos, images, diagrams tend to be very, very low on the scale for what they would be willing to adopt. What we then ask is the same people, the same format, and we say, what's your likelihood to adopt self-authored resources by type? We see a massive increase across pretty much every single category. People are very willing to self-author before they use commercial resources. And then if we ask them about open resources, we end up with a very similar level to what we find with self-authoring. Now, this to me is really interesting because not only does it show that people um, are more likely to either author the material themselves or go looking for open content over commercial materials. So this gives us a foundation that we can work with 
If that's happening at your institution, that is a good story that you could already work with. What it also shows is that when we've got almost equivalency between people being able to author material themselves or use OER, we get to a point where we can say to people, well, either one, adopt an existing OER and you can potentially save yourself some, some workload that way. Or if you're going to author this content already, why don't we make it openly licensed? Why don't we share it? So there's actually a foundation that could be leveraged here across, um, well, in this case, it was across all three of the, of the, uh, the institutions where we can actually have people working from a base where they're already doing the work. Why don't not get some more benefit? The last point that I'd like to make about this is that when we look at the range of formats and the type of representation, things like online quizzes, uh, podcasts, audio content, video, ebooks, okay, a whole range of digital learning materials, the likelihood to use those formats goes up if there is support for people to either produce them themselves or find them in an open context as opposed to going with commercial resources. So again, that has really strong implications for how we approach online learning. Now, at the next level, we've got awareness of support, and this is a huge one. Uh, there was a recognition that libraries were predominantly the drivers and centers of activity for any type of support that was occurring. However, there was also a, uh, a very strong realization that it was not just the library that had to be involved. And this disconnected or the need to connect and integrate services came through very, very strongly. So this, in this case, we have an academic librarian mentioning that it's all fine and good for the library to push things forward, but it has to be adopted by a learning and teaching unit in order to be effective. Um, and in many ways, there is a link between support and vulnerability when we talk about academic staff. So they mentioned many times that they felt that there was a real disconnect between the myriad of services that they needed in order to successfully implement either the creation of an OER or using open um, educational resources more broadly. So they mentioned the fact that they would need a copyright officer. They need a discipline librarian, perhaps a media producer, a graphic designer. And they say that it's very difficult to communicate across divisions. This makes it really hard when you work with the librarian and then you go to work with the graphic designer and you've got to explain things over again. And this was mentioned by a number of respondents where they felt as though the more people they engaged, the more times they had to explain themselves. And it felt like starting from scratch over and over and over again, and that they were looking for ways that maybe they could save everyone's time. But overwhelmingly, they recognized that they needed experts from different areas. I want to move as well in terms of support to, to attitudes. Now, what really interested me was, are we really speaking the same language? Are we really using the same terms? And do we value the same things? And so I broke up across the three, um, uh, across the three case studies, I broke up some of the questions between academic staff responses and professional staff responses. Now, anywhere that you see a green diamond is where there was complete agreement between the two staff um, classifications. This one was, if you were to describe OER to a colleague, what traits would you emphasize? There was a list and they could select up to three. Now, if we're being fair, in the top one, we can see that it's pretty much the same, just in different orders here, you know, can be combined with existing resources is number three on academic staff, but it's number five for professional staff. And this was a level of importance, but they, they both agreed free to access and use and doesn't require copyright clearance processes. So that was at case study site one. At site two, we had agreement broadly, but then when you took a look at the other responses, there's a lot of of things that just don't line up or simply don't show up on the list at all. And in, um, and in case study three, 
a very similar approach was found. So this is partial alignment. We need to do a lot more work around thinking about, well, who are the people that we support? What do they value? What do they want out of this? And then building support services that recognize and meet them where they are at. We also have where attitudes don't align. And this was a question at the end around the five priorities for OEP staff by classification. So this is where we should be going strategically. And when you look at this, I put a, a, a green arrow next to anything where there is perfect alignment. You will see that across one, two, and three, there isn't an alignment on any level of any priority. There are similar things, again, to be fair, there are similar things, but we have academic staff talking about things like awareness raising. They want communities of practice to support reward and recognition schemes, ensuring that OER are provided in a format that is easy to modify. Professional staff are valuing things like uh, professional development um, schemes, institutional policy, establishing national policy and the like. So there is a disconnect occurring here between the attitudes and the priorities at a strategic level. Now, obviously, one of the explanations here as well is that they're looking at themselves. Professional staff are saying, well, I actually think professional learning is really important because that's what I need. I look at my colleagues, that's what they need. The academic staff are, of course, looking at their needs. But again, we have a situation where attitudes are not aligning. And this is very worrying from a support perspective. So moving on to something practical so we can finish up um, with, with something that hopefully you can take home as well. And knowing as well that this is just a very small snapshot. And what I've done is I've broken up some recommendations by the level of the ecology. So at the micro system, I have the practitioner values. And um, unsurprisingly, Practitioners are motivated by their values. They enact their values as practice. And when they do, they become very deeply engaged with learning and teaching. They become deeply engaged with their students and the outcomes and providing opportunities for people. So as a result, this needs to be recognized. We need to recognize that there are people who are actually in these positions. There are people who are bringing with them their own life worlds and their own values. How do we actually provide the environment where we allow those values to come to the front? For MISO systems, for learning and teaching. So rather than having professional development opportunities as completely separate, most of the staff were talking about integration. So the idea that when you're doing anything about open licensing, don't have it as a separate activity. If you already have copyright training, embed open licensing as part of the copyright training. If you're going to do something about searching for OER, integrate it with existing library classes. Integrate OEP with staff induction programs. Those are the sorts of things where we're looking for ways to connect within the institution. And again, even with um, collecting data, integrating that with the teaching metrics of the institution. Don't present open as this radical reality that is going to be confronting. Instead, look for ways to embed it with things that people are doing already. From an exosystem from, from the support, it really is about the fact that we currently create support structures to mirror our organizational charts. We have discrete bits of support scattered across the university, and there needs to be a far more connected experience for users, making OEP everyone's business. And importantly, we need to have staff who are in a position where they can coordinate those groups. We refer to those often as third space professionals. They could be library staff. We're in an open educational practice project or an activity, the librarian acts as a third space professional to coordinate and also to facilitate introductions and, the, and project manage work. This is something that would be highly valued by academic staff who were interviewed. And then, of course, of macro systems. I talk about joining things up a lot. When we are doing advocacy at the, um, at the level 
of the institution. What we need to then do is to celebrate the successes that we have at the institution and then look for ways to connect institutions across the sector because a single institution is not going to be able to get the same level of advocacy outcome at the government level than if a group bands together, shares their practice, and then we actually have a coordinated approach to national advocacy. Now I'm going to leave you with those recommendations for today. Um, and before, um, before we sign off, I have references, you'll be able to check those out. As promised, all of the image credits uh, that you'll be able to check out as well, because those are of interest to people. And so what I would ask now, is rather than do you have any questions, I would be very keen to know what people are thinking about. We do actually have several questions, um, ah, Adrian. Yeah, you've sparked a lot of a lot of questions. Um, cool. Uh, Rani asked, I want to read it out loud because I love the way she's phrased it. Um, <laughs> she said, this may be useful for the call OER collective academic author community of practice sessions. How do we get access to this sweet bit of research? OK, so <laughs> once once my examiners have decided uh, on what the final version looks like. And then I have six weeks after that, um, it'll end up getting published. I will have a CC license on this and I do intend on slicing it up during the year um, so that I can get some journal article publications. But I would imagine that it probably won't be later than about mid year or thereabouts, fingers crossed, everything is sorted and I can actually share the complete thesis. Brilliant. I'm looking forward to those articles too. Um, James has a couple of questions. Uh, mm -hmm. He said, um, how can we move towards open by default? And then also he's asked, which higher ed institutions in Australia have the most progressive OEPs? Okay, so in terms of, of the, the education that has the most progressive, it depends on what your criteria are. Um, there is a piece of research that I was a part of, which was conducting a first phase national audit of Australian higher education. And that article has been published in Eurodal. Um, that one looked at a range of 40, I'm pretty sure it was 40 criteria. Um, and we did a desktop audit of every institution to see what was actually present. Um, so I would actually refer you to that article to take a look. And we have a follow up article that is going to be published in AJET very soon. Um, so check that article out near Roddle and you can actually then take a look at the criteria. This is not me kind of you know, fobbing people off. This is rather me saying, well, if you look at the criteria, you'll be able to see what's in, important to you, and then you'll be able to see which institutions are doing that. Um, and the second question, sorry, was how do, we, how do we make it by default? Well, predominantly, we have a, a huge amount of goodwill. We saw that with the ideology of staff. They want to enact these as values. We need to create an environment where that is actually possible. So one, leverage that goodwill. If we have people who are already doing it, lift them up, show their work and actually recognize and reward what they are doing. Okay, give plenty of opportunities, learning and teaching events, webinars, seminars, all of those sorts of things. Give people a chance to shine. The second thing I think is that you need a commitment at the highest level of the institution to agree that this is something that we do that open is something that we subscribe to. Not that it is a radical transformation that will cause an apocalypse in higher education, as MOOCs presented. MOOCs were going to be the destruction of everything we held near and dear. 11 years later, we're still here. So are MOOCs. And so we need to actually fold that into what we're doing already. And Stephen and I were talking just before this about all of the all the discussion at the moment around um, AI, artificial intelligence, and what it means for academic integrity. We've been having a lot of discussions here at UDSQ about how open assessment as an authentic form of assessment can actually be used as a way to really highlight good academic principles also working out in the open, those sorts of things. So look for challenges that already exist or look for practices that already exist. 
And a lot of the work that I do with folks, I say to them, what's your school interest in? What's your discipline doing at the moment? And they might say things like, oh, well, there's been a discussion around how the textbook is a single point of reference and is one person's voice, but I can't set six textbooks. What can I do? At which case you can say, well, there are articles. You could take a chapter from a whole range of textbooks. It's meeting people where they're at and not presenting this as radical and different, but rather this is something that helps you do what you were going to do anyway. I'm just really? noting that it's a couple minutes past the hour. Um, obviously, that yeah, there have been a lot of questions and it's been such a fantastic presentation raising a lot of different um, yeah things to think about. So maybe we can revisit uh, and follow up the discussion in one of the OEP special interest group uh, monthly meetings. Um, and Adrian, is it okay if people uh, email you to get in touch about your research? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Great. Okay. Uh, if you can chuck your email in the chat so people can get in touch, that would be great. Um, but yeah, as for now, thank you everyone for coming and massive thank you to Adrian and massive uh, congratulations on submitting your thesis. And I hope you... Uh, What's it called? I don't know. Pass with flying colours or whatever it's, whatever the formal words are. And uh, yeah, we will upload the uh, recording of this to our YouTube channel uh, so you can re-watch it if you really enjoyed it or you can share it with your colleagues who weren't able to make it. So thanks everyone for coming and see you next time. Thank you very much for the opportunity, Stephen.